Today's video was recorded on January 24th, 2023. Today's lesson is the second in our series on God's appointed feasts, sometimes called God's holidays. And in this lesson, we're going to focus on the first of the seven holidays, Passover. Passover is the central holiday in the collective consciousness of the Jewish people in Jesus' day. This holiday celebrates when God overthrew the totalitarian Pharaoh and delivered the nation of Israel. Many in Jesus' day longed for God to once again show up on Passover to deliver the Israelites from the Roman Empire. God had done it in the past, they thought. Certainly, he can do it again. So it's this holiday, the Passover, that Jesus is going to die on the cross as the Lamb of God, God's Passover Lamb. And there are so many details from the Hebrew Bible that are repeated in the New Testament in the events surrounding Jesus. Clearly, the New Testament writers see Jesus as the Passover lamb, the Passover lamb that God sacrificed for the whole world. Now, because there are so many details and they take time to become familiar with, we've provided a class handout for you, and this will help you manage all of the data. So make sure you look at that description section below and grab the class handout, and there will be a link to our website. You can download the PDF. Because the study of the Bible is so detail-oriented, each week we provide a handout for our lessons. And we do this to help you follow along with the lesson, organize your thoughts, and keep track of the many details and thoughts that you might have from each lesson. As you build your foundation of these details, things will begin to jump out at you from the text in places that you've never seen before. It's really cool to see when that happens. It's when this happens, when we see deeper into the text, that we can clearly see the revealing nature of Scripture. The more we study, the more is revealed to us. So we hope you enjoy today's lesson on Passover and how we can know from the New Testament that Jesus is our Passover lamb. We're going to start off today. This is from Paul. And Paul clearly sees Jesus within the context of Passover. So that's from 1 Corinthians 5.7. We'll, we'll go back to it later. But I just want you to see he's clearly recognizing that Jesus is the Passover lamb. As I like to say, he's God's Passover lamb. First, the Israelites have a lamb. That pulls them out. Then every year you have a lamb, and then at that one year, somewhere around 33 AD, God said, I'll tell you what, folks, now it's my turn, and I'm going to offer up my lamb. And this lamb, if you're covered in the blood, the whole world is redeemed. And that's, of course, the good news is that that's available to the world. He's, he's showing us in a vivid picture that God wants us to be redeemed back into his household. So Christ, our Passover lamb, we'll come back to that. Now the painting painted in somewhere around 1670, a Spanish painter, title, The Sacrificial Lamb. So good representation of our topic tonight, because Jesus is our Passover lamb. So if we look, this is number one on your uh, sheet, because for Christians, most of our emphasis is on the New Testament. We miss Perhaps Easter, well, Easter is related to Passover, but Easter and Christmas are our two big holidays. But Passover, in the collective conscience of the Jewish people, it was the central holiday. Exodus is, you know, you could argue the central book of the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, because that's the one where we're telling the story of what happened. And Exodus is the story of all of Judaism as well. It's just the most important story for them. And so it's important for Christians to understand just how central this is for those New Testament writers, the New Testament audience. Even Paul and all the rest of the, the New Testament writers, they don't leave Passover behind. They see Jesus as the next stage in this drama that's unfolding that's part of God's plan of redemption. And so Jesus is intimately associated with Passover and that symbolism for the holiday, and it carries right into his ministry, his death, resurrection, ascension. We'll see all that. 
and off the top of my head, I can't quite remember the number, six or eight times in the first century, people were rising up, usually the zealots. They were rising up. They hated Rome, and they would rise up and try to get God to once again destroy the enemy, and they would do it on Passover. So everybody knows this is the, the holiday that God's going to overthrow the tyrant. That's central in their collective consciousness. All right. So for Christians, if you want to focus on a book of the Old Testament, do the book of Exodus, because so much of understanding Exodus will help you in the New Testament. And that's what we did last year. We spent, it was 30 episodes of Exodus that we did last year. And you look into that symbolism and how it all fits together. And that's, that goes right into the New Testament. Okay, next slide. So what I have there first on your handout is that Passover shows up throughout the Old Testament. I should have put Old Testament on the top just to be more precise. And every time it shows up in the Old Testament, it's a turning point for the nation of Israel. And I would argue that when it shows up in the New Testament, what the writers are saying is there's another turning point happening. Now, it's not always easy to see for those people that were living then while it's happening. You know, we have, we have 2,000 years, well, we have 2,000 years of hindsight to look at it, and people today even have a hard time seeing. But you have the first Passover. Okay, that's Exodus 12, and that celebrates, of course, it's the birth of a nation. And literally, it's a birth of a nation. So every time Passover happens again, it's like a rebirth. And we even use that language, born again. There's something renewing. There's something about this holiday that renews for uh, the Jewish people throughout the Bible. So the first one, that becomes, that becomes the, the archetype, in a sense, of the holiday that we see in Exodus. The next time you see the holiday is Joshua. He's entering the Promised Land. It's in Joshua 5. Now, we're not going to look at, we're not going to turn to the text in any of these. I just want you to get the point. Now they're done with their time in the wilderness. And there's a water crossing event, right? Where God splits the water and Joshua has to lead them through the water. They come into the promised land. Very first thing they do, Passover. It's a rebirth. It's a renewal of the nation. Then we see Josiah. He renews the covenant. And remember, covenant is a marriage. Marriage is a covenant. So they're in a relationship with God. It's a covenantal relationship, and God wants to covenant with us in relationship. And of course, Israel, well, they're supposed to be in relationship with God, but how they're described in the Old Testament as an adulterous wife. They've gone, they've strayed from their husband. And so now Josiah, as a king, he brings them back. He renews their covenant promises, just like if you did your wedding vows again, and you say, we're back in relationship again. And so God it's a renewal at once more, a rebirth. The next one on your sheet is Hezekiah. And Hezekiah is going to reform the temple. He's going to get everybody back into worship. He actually invites everybody, all the Israelites, even from the, uh, from the north. And once again, similar to Josiah, things had fallen away. Other gods crept in. And now you're going to renew the covenant. And so once again, you have this idea of renewal or rebirth. Now, they end up going into captivity. It doesn't, it's not sustained because just like the golden calf, even when you say yes to a covenant with God, we end up sinning somewhere. So they go to, into captivity and then they come out of captivity, Ezra and Nehemiah. Now, what do you think is going to happen when Ezra and Nehemiah come back to rebuild the temple? What do you suppose we're going to find in the Bible? Well, a Passover celebration. So once again, you see it there. And these are all great to go in, look at those verses and read them on how they're celebrating the Passover and how excited they are to be celebrating back into, back into that covenant with God. All right. So you can see, if you're a first century Jewish person, this Passover is again, collectively in your psyche, 
it is uh, it's central. And when you have a an oppressive totalitarian rule like Rome, you want nothing more than for God to show up again. And that's is what this is what they want for Jesus, right? This is what they they want to make him king to lead them go kill the Romans, Jesus. He says, "No, that's not what I'm here to do." But again, I think what's happening though is when Jesus comes as the Passover lamb, you do have a rebirth. People are born again and it carries on even today when you recognize Jesus as that lamb that we go through the same process. And it's remarkable and I think it's good for us to reflect a little bit on the Old Testament to see that these aren't just random holidays. There's there's a theme going on here. So I just wanted to point that out about Passover, just how important it is recognizing that when our New Testament writers are weaving so much in about Jesus and the Passover, like John has three Passovers, and perhaps we'll talk about that at some point. Why does he why is he emphasizing that Passover? Well, it's a new beginning after Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension. So, okay, just some thoughts about the Old Testament. Now, we need to talk then, uh, number two, as we get into some of these details about the Passover, I want to try to at least flesh out as much as possible the details so that we can see them in the New Testament, how they're happening. So one of the big questions is timing timing. When do these holidays begin? And this gets very confusing because the word Passover and the festival of unleavened bread are are stuck together. And you get a little bit confusing about, uh, confused about what's happening. And of course, it's a religious item. So nobody can agree on anything when it comes to a religious item. All right. So I'm going to start with a verse from Luke. Now we did this last week. I'm going to go a little bit quicker on this one, so if you want to look in Luke, you can, but what I want to point out, Luke 22.1, this, of course, is right before the event that in our Christian term would be the Last Supper, but it's clearly a Passover meal, and I tried to emphasize that last week. They're telling us, Luke's going to tell us over and over and over, It's the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is called the Passover. And so you have two separate things, but they're smooshed together. Festival of Unleavened Bread, that's a seven-day feast, and it's called the Passover. Okay? So that was last week in Luke. Now, we're going to try to figure out how this is going to flow, not only in Exodus, but then for Jesus as well. So that's what we're going to carefully walk through this. So the big question that I had last week, when does a Jewish day begin? And I know you guys already know the answer to this, but a Jewish day begins at sundown, right? Now, why? Well, that's how God creates the world. So if we Look at Genesis, and this is repeated over and over and over in Genesis. Genesis 1 says, and there was evening, and there was morning, right? So which one comes first? Evening does. So I don't know what our problem is, but God made it pretty clear. Your day starts in the evening, and I think spiritually, this speaks to us, right? God takes you from darkness to light. That's how he creates. That's how he moves human beings. I was blind and now I see. I was in the dark and God illuminated this for me. It's evening to morning, darkness to light. That's a powerful uh, motif out of, out of Genesis as God is creating. Okay, so the day begins in the evening. That's uh, number one, right? I'm going to call it 6 p.m. It's whenever sundown is. Okay, now, if you would, turn with me to Leviticus, because we're going to be back in Leviticus and Exodus. So if you want to turn in your Bible, let me see. If you want to turn in your Bible, that'll just help. We're going to look at both Passover uh, when it starts, and we'll look at unleavened bread when it starts. Uh, 
So Leviticus 23, verse 5, this is going to be our verse on Passover. Okay, so Leviticus 23, 5 says, In the first month, on the 14th day of the month, now in this version it says, in the evening, most Bibles say, at twilight, is the Lord's Passover. And notice, and I put this down on your, uh, on your sheet, Passover is not called a feast. It's something that God does. Today, when someone says Passover, they're talking about the Feast of Unleavened Bread. You start with a meal. That's the Passover Seder. But really, the Lord's Passover is an event that's happening, and it's God's event. And it's not, never called a festival in the Bible. The festival that starts is the unleavened bread. We'll see that in a minute. Because you notice here in Leviticus, there's no mention of a sacrifice. And if you're going to have a sacrifice, you need to have a time for that. Here it says in the evening or at twilight, but we're going to find out that's actually incorrect, so you might need your pen to make a correction. Jewish holidays usually start with an evening meal, right? Right at the beginning of the day, you're going to have a meal. That's going to be uh, the festival of unleavened bread. So we're going to deal with that word twilight in a minute, but let me show you unleavened bread. It's the very next verse. Look at verse 6. Okay, so a day begins at sundown, and this just says, on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So we're going to have a feast starting on the 15th, which means at 6 p.m. on the 15th. So we have to sacrifice our lamb prior to that in order to have the lamb prepared. This is actually the day that God passes over everybody. So that's why in Luke, you can say, this is the Feast of Unleavened Bread that's called the Passover. So when they're coming out of Egypt, when God's passing over the houses that have the blood on it, it's actually on the 15th day. Okay, so on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread to the Lord, and seven days you shall eat bread. So it's a seven-day festival. Okay. Or if you shall eat unleavened bread. My bad. Okay, so here's what I want to do. I'm going to put, I, I have this little diagram on your handout. I'm going to pull this up. So Feast of Unleavened Bread is a seven-day feast, and it starts on the night of the 15th. So it goes the 15th, the 16th, the 17th. You can see over on your handout, on your handout I have P1, Passover 1, Passover 2, Passover 3, all the way out to Passover 7. That's the Festival of Unleavened Bread. And then if we say, okay, well, when does that Jewish day begin? Well, it's 6 p.m., right? Let's look 6 p.m. for each one, okay? So the question is, and what we're going to get to in a second, when do we sacrifice that lamb? So we're going to eat it right after 6 p.m. on the 15th. Now. If we read our Bible and say, on the 14th day in the evening or at twilight, then we have to think, well, what's our conception of twilight? What's our conception of evening? Because if we think evening on the 14th day, well, that's right here. It's the very beginning of the 14th day. That's what I would, most people, when they think of twilight, right? It's this period of time. After the sun has gone down and before the light is, before it's gotten fully dark. That's usually what we think of twilight. Um, I was telling a friend of mine who I used to fly with. When we were flying together, I was telling him about this lesson today, but when we were flying together, uh, we would fly on night vision goggles and we had to pay attention to twilight. We had to, it was something called EENT. I know this means nothing, but just so you know, end of evening nautical twilight. That was really important for night vision goggles because when the sun got to a certain point below, if it was too high, your night vision goggles wouldn't work that well. So you want it low enough. End of evening nautical twilight. The end of evening twilight, we could put our night vision goggles on. Before that, too much light. So twilight, in our English, is sometime after the sunset b before it gets completely dark. Okay? Okay. 
So if we read that, we would say, ah, we need to sacrifice the lamb and then 24 hours later eat it. But that's not, that's not what they're doing. They're going to sacrifice it and then immediately cook it and eat it, okay? I know I'm, I'm beating this uh, to death, but it's really important that we understand when we get to Jesus what's going on with that holiday. So you're going to eat this 24 hours later. Well, that wouldn't be good. You don't have refrigeration or anything. So you don't sacrifice the lamb at the beginning of the 14th day. And what we're going to find out is in practice, they're going to sacrifice that lamb at 3 p.m. on the 14th day. So that the day's almost over. There's only three hours left. You sacrifice the lamb at 3 p.m. You immediately cook the lamb. And now you eat your feast starting on the 15th day. And that's what's going to happen in the book of Exodus. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about where do they get 3 p.m. And this idea of where our Bible translates twilight or evening. Because I think what really should be happening is in our Bibles, they should be putting a footnote. So where it says twilight, it needs to have a footnote that then explains that in practice, it was at 3 p.m., because that's not what we think about twilight. Okay, so what then is twilight here in the Bible, or what is evening? Well, it's a difficult phrase in Hebrew for them to translate, obviously, because we get something that ends up being so uh, dramatically wrong in our mind, 3 p.m. doesn't seem like twilight. The phrase looks like this. I'm just going to put it in Hebrew for anybody that would come later and want to see what that Hebrew phrase is. Ben ha arbaim. And what that means in very literally, and I have this on your sheet, it means between the settings. Now, that's a weird phrase, between the settings. What settings? Well, it would be, obviously, the settings of the sun, but which settings are we talking about? So if you, uh, for anybody, this again, this is for the video, if anybody really wants to see how this, this phrase, bane, bane is between, so right there, bane, ha, means the. This is a little lesson in Hebrew for everybody. Erbaim, settings. And the im at the end of a Hebrew word is plural. So there you go. Between the settings. Now, what does this mean? Well, in practice, here's how they interpret that, that phrase. So you come right here, and we'd say it looks like this. The sun rises, call it 6 a.m., yes? So the sun begins an upward trajectory in the sky. When does it peak? When does it reach its zenith? Well, we'll call it 12 noon for sake of, for ease. So the, the sun gets to 12 noon, and this is where the rabbis say, ah, now as soon as the shadows begin to lengthen, that's the first setting of the sun. Okay? Between the settings, there's the first setting. Then the sun begins its downward until it gets to the horizon. We'll call it 6 p.m. And when it goes below the horizon, that's the second setting. And so if you said, well, what's between, what's the time frame between 12 noon and, and 6 p.m.? Draw a little line, and we would call it 3 p.m., 3 in the afternoon. Now, that's on our clock. That's how we tell time. But in a Jewish day, they just number the hours of the day, 1 through 12. So you start in the morning, first hour, second hour, third hour, all the way out till the till it's then the beginning of the first watch of the night. And so what would 3 p.m. be? Well, the ninth hour. Now, why do we need to know this? Why am, I, why am I beating this up, right? Well, because what time does Jesus die on the cross? And all of our Bible writers tell us this. Because if the, if the, if the Passover lamb is to be sacrificed at 3 p.m., then where does Jesus need to be at 3 p.m. on the 14th of the first month? He needs to be on the cross. And guess what? If you would turn with me to Mark 15, it's verses 33 and 34. Now, you'll find this also in Matthew. You'll find it also in Luke. So they all say the same thing. 
And every time you see a very important, you see a detail that's in the New Testament, you say, why did they feel the need to tell us that? Why was it that Mark wants us to know the time, what time it was? And so Mark 15, 33 and 34, it starts out, there was darkness. Now it was noon. There was darkness over the whole land. Until what time? Three in the afternoon. Now many of your Bibles, the translation will say until the ninth hour. It was the sixth hour, and then it was dark until the ninth hour. Well, ninth hour is three in the afternoon. And then the next verse says, and then at three in the afternoon, Jesus called out in a loud voice. And you can read the rest, but that's the point where he's giving up his spirit. And so it's crazy. At 3 p.m., right, that Passover lamb in the temple, which is inside the city walls, there is a lamb being sacrificed for the nation. Every day at 3 p.m. at the temple, there was a sacrifice for the nation. It's called the, it's called the Tamid. So 3 p.m., if you notice in the New Testament, you'll see it a couple times in the book of Acts. Why is 3 p.m. an important time? Why is Peter praying at 3 p.m.? Because there's a sacrifice going on for the nation in Jerusalem. And on this Passover, outside the city wall, God's Passover lamb for the whole cosmos is being put to death at the exact same time. That's why Mark and Matthew and Luke want us to know a very specific detail about the timing of his death. They would all understand that. Now, I put on your handout, just for reference, the first one is there's a rabbi. His, uh, he goes by the name of Radak, and it's uh, David, um, let me see, Kim He. Well, it would be a, a gu the guttural Kim He. And he lived in the 12th century going into the 13th century. He has a writing that's describing all of this, the way the sun moves and how they figured out 3 p.m. But we do have, from the first century, a reference to the Passover sacrifice at 3 p.m. It comes from Josephus. And so if you happen to have a copy of Josephus, you can look it up. I put where it comes from. But that's important because Josephus is Jewish. He's, he understands that Passover system, or I'm sorry, the, the sacrifice system. He understands the holiday system. Now, Josephus, even though he has a name, Flavius, it's because when he got captured, he was, a, he was fighting the Romans. He gets captured by one of the Flavians, Vespasian, the, who will eventually become the emperor. And so when, when the, the Flavian Vespasian becomes the patron to Josephus, he adopts the name Flavian. That's why Jews for a long time never read Josephus. They called him a traitor. He turncoated and went with the, uh, the Romans. But anyways, now we have this great writing that comes out of Josephus. I just want to point out, it's, this is not speculation. We've got first century witness, and then we've got witness from the rabbis on how you calculate that. Very important that we know the time. Okay, uh, and those references are on your handout. All right, so we tackled that one. What time is twilight? That's why I mean it needs to be footnoted in your Bible to say this was generally considered to be three o'clock in practice based on the way the, 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 based on the phrase. Okay, now what I want to do, and you can turn in your Bible to Exodus 12 because this is the first place that we see the Passover and we see the lamb. Now that we've solved the mystery of twilight and when that lamb is sacrificed. So what I want to do is lay out, and there, I, I didn't really intend to pick seven, but there's seven details. That's a good biblical number. Seven details that come out of Exodus 12 that we're also going to find in the New Testament. Some of them will take a little bit of explaining. Other ones, I'm going to go over just in the interest of time, and you can look them up later. So from Exodus 12, one of the key things in Exodus 12, if you look at the very first verse, God says, okay, this is going to be the first month of the year. Now, that happens to coincide with somewhere around March to April. So it's a springtime. God set the new year in the spring. And the Romans, by the way, used to celebrate New Year's in the spring. And then 
the Gregorian calendar switched it to be closer to the birth of Jesus. But we used to have New Year's. I believe what this may be an apocryphal story, but I believe what happened was, you know, the king says, all right, um, all you city folk who go along with the king, we're going to switch our New Year's from April 1st over to uh, uh, January 1st. And everybody who went along with the king, they said, great, we'll go along with you. But you know how it is, the further out you get from the king, the more you don't want to go along with it, what the king's saying. And so you would have people who still celebrated New Year's, they would come into town on April 1st. Now, what do you suppose that all of the cultured people called those little, you know, the, the country folk that would come into town on April 1st? Well, they called them April Fools, because you would come in and celebrate New Year. So now we have an April Fool's Day that used to be New Year's Day. Anyways, I think that's true. I, if it's not, I apologize. It makes a great story, right? You hope it would be true. All right. So God says, this is the first of your month, for, uh, first month of the year. This is what we're kicking off the year. Then he says in verse 3, look at Exodus 12, verse 3. He's going to say, hey, look, I want all of you people to select your lamb on the 10th day. God's going to be very specific. We'll call it Lamb Selection Day. So Exodus 12, verse 3, God says, Speak to the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb. And you're going to bring that lamb into your household, and you're going to inspect that lamb, and you're going to take care of that lamb, and the kids are going to give the lamb a name. And on the fourteenth day, guess what? You're going to have to sacrifice that lamb. So there's a great lesson for the kids in here. Uh, about sacrifice, but 10th day of the month, okay? So lamb selection day. It's when everybody is going to select their lamb. So I'm just going to put this up uh, on the screen. I want to I want to kind of walk through. What does that mean, 10th day? So here's the 10th day, okay? That's a lamb selection day. If we follow the calendar then, the 11th day, the 12th day, the 13th day, Till eventually God's going to say, okay, on the 14th day, sacrifice 3 p.m. There's your lamb, sacrifice on the 14th day. And then on the 15th day, that's when you're going to start the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is also called the Passover. And that's the night that God passes over the houses of the Israelites. Okay. Now I'm going somewhere with this. So if we take the 15th day, and we start counting backwards, we're going to see something in John, right? So from the 15th day, we get one, two, three, four, five, six. Six days prior. Now, five days prior is Lamb Selection Day. Why did I take you back to six? Well, we got to go to John for that, okay? John tells us something. As Jesus is coming towards, so that's Lamb Selection Day. Oh, by the way, I just want you to think about this. We, we have a group of people in the first century who are zealous about keeping God's commands. So if God says, pick your lamb on the 10th day, what do you suppose all of Jerusalem is doing on the 10th day? They're picking their lamb. And this is so critical to the story of Jesus. So, Keep your finger in Exodus 12 and look at John 12. Now I'm going to take you to two verses in John 12. And in John 12, verse 1, he says, Then six days before Passover, so now we have a time frame, six days before Passover, Jesus came to Bethany. Bethany is literally right outside of the Sabbath walk from the city of Jerusalem. It's right on the other side. Of the Mount of Olives. And he's going to where Lazarus was, and now it tells us that they had a dinner, and there's some stuff that happens, but it's six days before Passover. So John gives us a detail that we need to know. Then if you look at verse 12, it says this, on the next day, so the next day from that sixth day, a large crowd had come, because Jesus is coming to Jerusalem. Well, what day is the next day? If we go back to this, it's five days on 
And that's what we call the triumphal entry. The triumphal entry is happening on Lamb Selection Day. Why? Because Jesus is the Lamb, right? He's presenting himself to Jerusalem to say, Pick me, people. I'm enough for your family. Because that's an exodus, right? Pick me. I mean, Jesus, he doesn't miss anything. And we kind of leave out this one little detail of the 10th. So Lamb Selection Day is the triumphal entry. But he's coming to say, look, I'm going to be your lamb, but I'm not going to do what you want me to do. You want me to overthrow the Romans, and I'm going to show you the love of God. That's the path to redemption. It's a radical shift from what the people wanted, right? The people wanted power. Jesus says, let's go love your neighbor. That's the path to redemption. So it's really cool that we see that that 10th day, Lamb Selection Day, is the day that Jesus rolls into town, counting backwards from the Passover, starting on the 15th. So right off the top, we have Lamb Selection Day. We see something in the text from John that shows up. All right, the next two, you guys, I think, know this, and you'll be able to go back and look. In Exodus verse 5, or Exodus 12 verse 5, uh, the text says you have to select a lamb without a defect. Well, what do we call that when it's Jesus, right? We say he's sinless, and that's what Peter says. First uh, Peter, you can look this up, and it's on your handout. First Peter one nineteen, a lamb without blemish or defect. So there you go. He is that Passover lamb. Uh, next on your sheet, the sacrifice at twilight, and we just went over that. Uh, verse 6, you sacrifice on the 14th day at twilight, and that's actually the ninth hour, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So we find that in the New Testament. Let's keep going. Then you're going to put blood on the doorpost. That's not actually verse 3, and I apologize. It's verse 13. The blood is going to be a sign. So if you think about it, when you're covered with the blood of the Passover lamb, the spirit of death or the angel of death does not strike. And what would we say about a Christian? If you're covered in the blood of the sacrificed lamb, then you do not, or your death passes over you. So it's the same concept. And we find all over the New Testament this idea that you should be covered in the blood. And I put one example, 1 John uh, 1 7 on your handout about the blood of Jesus. So there's just another one that comes out of Exodus. The next one, verse 17 in Exodus 12. God says, okay, now we're going to talk about leaven and this idea of sin, and you need to get the sin out of your life. So we're not just going to do one day of not eating leaven. We're going to do a full seven days. So it actually gets difficult, you know. Uh, and this is where I want to go to the verse I started with, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. That was what Paul was saying about the Passover lamb, but I want you to see the verse right before it. because. Paul, in verse 6, the whole idea is leaven. So it's 1 Corinthians 5, verses 6 and 7. And so just listen to, the, to his metaphor talking about the leaven. He says, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little yeast leavens the whole lump? And there's some very interesting uh, commentary in some of the books talking about, especially some of the Jewish books, talking about unleavened bread and the importance of this working with yeast and making sure that you're not going too far with the, your bread so that it doesn't rise. It's very interesting when you think about the, the metaphor of our spiritual life. Okay, so a little yeast, there he is, he's talking about uh, leaven. And then he says in verse 7, Purge out the old yeast, so there it is again, so you may be a new lump, even as you are unleavened. So right there, before he even gets to the part about Christ being the Passover sacrifice, he has this whole thing about leaven. They all fit together. And then he finishes up, for indeed Christ our Passover has been sacrificed. So the festival of unleavened bread, Paul picks up on that metaphor of leaven. The next one that I have on your sheet is called A Night for Watching. This one I'm going to wait, okay? You can go read them in, in Matthew. I, got, I have the verses on your handout. 
But I want you to see when we talk about what's going on in the garden, that it's going right back to Exodus 12, because we're still in the Passover evening. So we'll do that in a couple of weeks. All right, last one. If you are in Exodus 12, look at verse 46. Peculiar little commandment from God that says, oh, by the way, when you're eating this, sacri- this Passover uh, lamb, do not break any of the bones. Okay? God's got his reasonings behind that. Perfect. The Israelites go through the whole Passover. But then let's go to Jesus, right? And what do we find in the book of John? The same thing. There's no broken bones. So now, again, keep your, keep your thumb in Exodus, and we'll go back to John. This is now Jesus on the cross, John 19, 33. He actually has two references to it, but I'm just going to show you one. So Jesus, they want to get him off the cross. It says, when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. And then John goes on and in, in another verse, I think it's 36, he says, and this was to fulfill, and he quotes Exodus. Your legs, when, you would, when they would crucify you, your legs keep you alive. You push up with your legs so that your lungs can get air into them because you're hanging from your arms and you're suffocating. So you have to keep pushing up with your legs. Eventually, you don't have any strength to do it any longer and you die. But if you, they want the person on the cross to die faster, what do you do? You break their legs. And the idea is they get there, no need to break the legs. So it's fulfilled in Jesus' death. God did it for them. They didn't have to go in and break the legs. Okay, now the point is this. You have all of this stuff in Exodus 12 and all on that second ha- uh, side of your handout. All of these little teeny details that when you get to the New Testament, in the events of Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension, and then more importantly, those gospel writers and Paul and Peter, they want you to know those details. And so they include them because their audience is going to pick them up. And so you not only have all that stuff from Exodus 12, but you have it repeated in the New Testament. And all of it is just screaming to those who have eyes to see that Jesus is fulfilling that idea of Passover lamb, but now as a metaphor, so that all of us are entering in, just like we don't have to go back to Egypt, we can go through our own exodus and celebrate our own deliverance that brings us uh, down the path of redemption. So when Paul says, Christ our Passover lamb, it comes out of that deep tradition, runs all the way back to the exodus story. And those Israelites know it, right? And unfortunately, the crowd is looking for that physical redeemer. But he's a spiritual redeemer. And he's going to redeem his people, no matter what your situation, into the kingdom of God. And that's good news, that whatever your situation is, you can start the process of redemption. God wants to save you from your sins or the totalitarian leader. So, hopefully... You're able to see this, and it's so important to be able to look at those details in depth because we can read past them so quickly, and you can see that our Bible, our English doesn't always help us unless you have a footnote. Very important to see how everything is lining up for Jesus on the cross as God's Passover lamb. The reason I put the time in for a handout is because so much of this information, you need to do it over and over and over and over, and we don't get it at our churches. You got that handout, then you can go back and say, now, where was that again? Oh, yeah, and you go forward and you look at all those comparisons, because they're really remarkable. And I would, if you have the time, uh, my point number one about Exodus throughout the, or I'm sorry, Passover throughout the New Testament, go read them in order, Joshua, Josiah, then in Chronicles with Hezekiah, and you can see how important it was. The, the holiday wasn't being celebrated, and they're renewing their uh, 
commitment to God using the Passover holiday. So it's a really cool how it becomes turning points for, for Israel. <laughs> 